I did. I just did. I did. I did. I did. I Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Salem Kaiser Budget Committee for April 24th, 2018. And we're going to start start by taking uh, attendance. I believe everyone is present except for Jim Green is absent. Okay. And so we're going to start the meeting by uh, hearing the superintendent's message for the 2018-2019 budget message. Thank you. All right, and did we get PowerPoint presentation out to the budget committee members? Okay, awesome. I couldn't tell from your spots whether they were there. So, um, oh, that's why you didn't sit there first. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll start. Uh, so this is our, uh, the 2019, 1819 proposed budget and just as a reminder uh, our vision is all students graduate and are prepared for a successful life one of our uh, guiding principles that we've been really uh, working hard on is around our equity lens and the board continues to ask uh, questions and asks us to be sure we're attending to equity across the district so in Salem Kaiser public schools we will not be confused with equality where students are all treated the same. We acknowledge that equity is both a process and an outcome which demands a relentless commitment to make changes to our system that are necessary to achieve our vision. Efforts around equity increase achievement of all students, not just those in underrepresented, underserved, or marginalized populations. The 1819 proposed budget uh, tonight will be uh, 691.4 uh, million dollars and it's distributed across multiple funds. And as you can see, 70% of our budget will be from the general fund. This is our general fund, $485.4 million. And as you can tell by this graph, 85% of our uh, general fund budget goes to people, uh, salaries, and associated payroll costs. Just as a reminder of who we are, uh, we are over 42,000 students right now. We have 65 schools. 7% of our students are talented and gifted. We have almost 60% of our students living in poverty. 16% of our students are receiving some sort of special education services. 19% uh, are uh, learning English. And we're about a 50% uh, white, 50% minority district. Some work we've been doing around behavioral learning and uh, we've started to kind of chart the numbers because we think that's really important. We have um, about 42,000 students. Uh, 2,000 of those students have some sort of individualized need. What we know from the national statistics is that one in four students are, have experienced some sort of childhood trauma and trauma that impacts education at times. Uh, for us, um, we know that um, about 500 to 1,000 of our students are experience some sort of complex social emotional learning. And 200 of our students are um, so significantly impacted by trauma that they're in very specialized self-contained classrooms. Important to note uh, that behavioral learning challenge for our students as it has uh, impact on accessing education. The other thing we're experiencing is a number of students with significant health needs. Uh, students on a 504 plan, these are some of our students that have um, health needs that require some specialized attention. So since 2011, we've had a 300% increase of students uh, on 504 plans. And uh, our students with type 1 diabetes have increased significantly over the past five years and this requires, in many cases, insulin administration directly by nurses or under the supervision of on-site nurses. Math is one of the areas we've been uh, thinking a lot about and it's been on our minds. Uh, level three and four on the Smarter Balanced Assessment would be considered proficient. We have 35% of our elementary students that would be considered uh, proficient and on grade level in math. 
If you look at level two, which is right below that level three, about 28% of our students, and then 37% of our students are at that very basic level across our elementary schools as measured by uh, the Smarter Balance. As we look at the, our trends on elementary math, you'll see that uh, even over the last three years, we've had a, a downward trend on our students that are proficient uh, in elementary schools. What we find is that when they get to the middle schools, our middle schools are performing uh, greater than average in comparison to their like school um, like schools across the state. So they're experiencing often more than a year's growth with students. And by the time our students get to 11th grade, we actually uh, just a right at state average or a little higher on our math um, test scores. But what we know is that if we could boost the foundation, we would um, boost achievement uh, for years to come. So it's been a really um, something that's high on our mind. Uh, this is our graduation rates. Um, as you can see, we've seen uh, little bits of little tiny upward trends, but not uh, significant upward trends. And so something for us to continue to pay attention to. This year, we did have an uptick in our four-year graduation rate. We also had a reduction in our dropout rate. But we need to see those trends continue and continue more significantly. These are our graduation rates by school. And I um, want to point out to you that uh, while Roberts shows a really dismal four-year cohort rate, what happens for kids at Roberts is they already come out, come behind. So often they, if they do graduate, get a GED, have some sort of completion, it doesn't come in that four-year time span. So that's why we see that low rate. And we happen to, when they transfer to Roberts, code them as if they're a at a school at Roberts. Really, that's indicative of achievement or lack of achievement that's happened across our high schools. Our career technical uh, graduation rates are important to note. Uh, I wish we did a great job of tracking our students who participate in music, our students who participate in extracurricular activities or drama, um, but the state happens to crack to track career and technical education. This become a topic across the state. You also see it in our proposal for our bond that we're addressing it in space, uh, in space needs because it's really a growing trend. And what the trend uh, will tell you is that the red bar is our district graduation rate. So in 1617, our district graduation rate was at 76%. Uh, um, if you go all the way to the blue graph, that's our CTE participants. They're at 90%. A CTE participant is a student who has taken even one CTE course in high school. It doesn't matter which one, it's just one. They graduate in four, uh, mm -hmm. in four years at um, 87%. Sorry, yeah, 87%. I was looking at two different years there. Uh, in the, um, for CTE concentrators, which are those students who have taken a full year in a state-approved CTE pathway. So our CTE program that's been state-approved, their graduation rate is at 96%. So, um, I'm sorry, 93, two sets of charts there. So what you can see is really great graduation rates when students are engaged and invested in school. I would predict if we put up a similar metric for some other uh, programs in our district, we'd see some similar uh, results. So uh, in the budget message, I also highlight uh, what I see as changes uh, for our strategic plan for the future. And this has lots of little writing, but I'm going to only show you the changes. And then when we get this uh, absolutely finalized as budget committee members, you'll get a final draft of it. But I'm going to highlight the changes. The first one is in uh, under improving student achievement. And in the past, it's been just around literacy <coughs> and the ever so significant difference is that we've added math. Really important at the elementary <coughs> level that we begin that intentional um, attention to math and those foundational skills in math. The second uh, cha big change is under number three. Uh, in our previous strategic plan, this was uh, three and four together. And I should have had those previous plans in front of you. I apologize for that. But what we've done is uh, put our RTI system and our positive behavior support systems 
under one strategic plan item because what we know is that it's both behavior and academics that create a multi-tiered system of support for our students and really important that we, inter uh, we attend to interventions in both. Under the PBIS, we've left strategically in our strategic plan tier two and tier three uh, work in PBIS because we know that's the next work of some of our kids. You will see uh, in some of our schools, you'll see this on our strategic plan for multiple years because it's a uh, five to seven year implementation plan and we need to keep really focused on that work for um, years to come. Uh, the number four last year was related to we had a special education outside evaluation and we began to do some planning around that. So we've changed this item to be uh, developing our action plan around what those work groups have done. So it's our year one action plan. This too will be on the strategic plan for multiple years. It's a matter of with our strategic plan keeping focused on our initiatives and not changing so that we're confusing uh, the work. And then finally, a really important one to us um, is that we're adding that we really need to attend to our internal communication systems. As technologies have changed, as our communications department has changed, we need to get uh, really precise and strong at how do we inter uh, internally communicate with our employee groups. So we thought this was important to add to the strategic plan this year. Uh, what you'll see in the budget is uh, some strategic investments. Uh, we'll invest, you'll see an investment in behavioral learning. You'll see funds to support the implementation of the math curriculum that was adopted or approved by the school board. We attempted stability of staffing and resources at the elementary, middle, and high so we can attend, continue to attend to graduation rates and then a, a small investment in student health and special education caseloads. So just the context for the budget this year. We are in the second year of the biennium. So for those of you new to the budget committee meeting, the, this, this means we actually know what revenue we're gonna get. The legislature's not in session and we can make some uh, fairly accurate predictions about what next year will look like. That's very different when we're in the legislative session and in year one of the biennium. Uh, last year, or this year when they provided the money to us, it was split 50% in each year of the biennium. That's an unusual pattern for the Department of Education. Typically, they uh, provide us 49% in the first year, 51% in the second year because they know there's an escalation of costs. 1% uh, for us equals about 5.8% a million dollars and in the last budget uh, season we strategically held a little extra in contingency to plan for that one percent. So uh, last year was a hard budget message year. Remember we reduced by about 60 positions. Uh, so this year we're primarily uh, status quo and so I, I would frame it as a not a lot of ads, not a lot of subtracts, a little bit of investment and a status quo budget um, because it's predictable and because we made those uh, strategic reductions in the first year of the biennium that helped us with the second year of the biennium. The work on uh, last year was also on um, some additional infrastructure needs. I believe if you remember, we made an investment in uh, fiber, which was a strategic investment in the budget committee process. That work is almost done and by June 30th because we secured the federal grant for that for 80 cents on the dollar, we will have a fully uh, functioning dark fiber network that belongs to the school district that will last us with enough bandwidth for we believe 10 to 20 years. Um, and over time we begin to see some slight reductions with, in some of our um, providers. But that was that strategic investment at the right time um, because sometimes putting money in uh, a one-time investment is helpful so you're not building up staffing and cutting it in the second year of the biennium. What we want to try to do is create uh, levelness so we're not up and down uh, with staffing. Higher, lay off, higher, reduce. 
uh, which can be a trend if you're really not careful with your budgeting. So this year, uh, the state school fund revenue is at uh, $332.8 million. Our roll-up costs alone were at $11.7 million when we took our uh, December staffing and rolled that up, uh, $11.7 million to include um, cost of living, insurance, all the associated costs, um, and any other escalating costs, so leases, things like that. And in the proposed budget, uh, I'm proposing a contingency of 21.9 million, which is 4.5%. I wanna make a note here, and I'll bring it up again. Last year was the first year of automating our budget system. Uh, you remember that was a big deal to us, um, to have a fully automated budget system. As we do that, that tightens the budget to be really much more accurate, which means it's really important to know that we don't have the same trends around how we'll trend with our contingency and ending fund balance. So we have budgeted for this year at uh, 4.5, which is 21.9 million. So what you'll see is new um, in the um, proposed additions in this budget. It's hard to call them out exactly in your budget document. I'm gonna slow down because I'm wondering if the pages are um, it's hard to see it exactly in your budget document, so I'll highlight them in this presentation. Uh, the first probably major investment and the investment, uh, the one uh, strategic investment in infrastructure will be, is a $3.55 million transfer to the asset replacement funds for elementary math curriculum. And uh, the elementary math curriculum is a little over $5 million. We already have $800,000 in that asset replacement fund. Uh, this will transfer in and make a fund total of $4.2 million to go towards the elementary math curriculum. Uh, my goal will be to still look for that additional million dollars so that every school has access to start uh, the new math adoption in year one, even though some schools may choose to wait till year two. As a point of reference for our budget committee members, who might not have heard our math presentation, we already have five schools that have piloted this curriculum. And from uh, a achievement standpoint for all kids, we're seeing uh, remarkable growth. But also it is working really well for our students with disabilities and our students who are English language learners. So both of those subgroups, when we apply the equity lens, that's why this investment is really important and important to them. We have not had a math adoption and I didn't research back how many years, <laughs> but years and years at that elementary level. And this is really important for that guaranteed and viable curriculum at the elementary level. We recently did a survey of our elementary licensed staff and about 88% of them, of those who answered the survey, which we had a good response rate, but 88% of those who answered uh, the survey were in favor of actually moving forward as a year one school. So we'll make some of those decisions in the coming weeks, but I did want you to know it's a robust process and really an important investment. So we also, um, in this proposed edition, have 6.5 positions or FTE for the Office of Behavioral Learning Embedded Cadre. What we have found that our district-wide cadre support goes into a school to help and stabilize uh, students and situations and then when they leave the school isn't quite ready for them to leave and we go back to where we were so we have been working to embed some behavior cadre so when they come to the school they stay at the school this is a strategy that's actually working well for us and we're seeing some good um, interaction in a regular education classroom for students with very complex behavior needs the next is a small addition in counseling. I would actually call this a technical adjustment. We were, we've been trying to find money each year to add, to round out some um, counseling staffing at some of our schools. There's also a $47,000 technical adjustment again for some compensation. We have a group of classified individuals who work in our very most restrictive, um, most volatile uh, classrooms in the district and we need them to stay there. Um, so there were other similar positions that were paid less. So we've adjusted some pay. We've also added 2.0 FTE for nurses. That those extreme health um, needs we haven't added to the nursing cadre 
in the years I've been here, and this is budget number four. So uh, not enough, but uh, to, to the um, staff. Uh, we've also uh, are working on some um, additions to special education to deal with some really disproportionate caseloads. Again, this is not enough, but we have two licensed educators, 1.88 instructional assistants, 0.4 for speech and language pathologists. Um, and then finally, we have uh, put in there about $475,000 in increases for the cost to go to Bend. As you know, we've worked hard to bring that number down and keep uh, bringing it down. When we are asked, why do you, why is this important? Why are you still traveling? Because we know that kids engaged in athletics and extracurricular activities are more engaged in school. So it's a really important graduation strategy, athletics is. Um, we also um, did an ad of 1.9 positions for licensed teachers at the secondary level, 6 through 12, because uh, we have uh, the need to be sure we're meeting the minimum requirements for English language acquisition for students learning English, and we've had a little escalation in that need at our secondary schools. And then uh, about $660,000 that fall into that technical adjustment, utilities, uh, food service, charter school payments. Uh, when you ask, you might ask why food service, um, we've had some changes in legislation on uh, what you can do for kids who uh, don't pay, uh, or families who don't pay the bill, and we've had about um, $120,000 escalation in costs uh, for unpaid um, bills that we're continuing um, to monitor with families. At the end of the day, our goal is to make sure kids are fed, and so um, we, are building that in. Uh, the total additions are $6.1 million, and uh, about 3.55 of that is that math adoption. And again, that investment in a thing that's a one-time expenditure helps us as we look forward to the next biennium. And that's, I think, an important note. Uh, we are in a position of not having massive reductions because, number one, we have growing enrollment, and number two, budget committee and board made a real, some really strong decisions last year, or we would be actually reducing additional positions this year. So uh, with that, I'm gonna look ahead a little bit because it's important to know what's coming. And um, you've probably heard lots about this, but for us, um, the public employment retire, employees retirement system is one of those looming things on the horizon for us. Uh, this board, over time, has done a phenomenal job of refinancing their unfunded debt. And so while we're seeing escalation of costs, we're not seeing the same escalation of costs that other districts who didn't uh, uh, refinance at the right time in the right market um, and have done it over time. The refinancing on the part of the board over the past, I think it's been 10 years, is actually saved millions of dollars in the system, millions of dollars that went back to um, kids, and fam kids and families in our community. And I think it's really important to note that because this board has been really good about how they thought about spending money and how they've invested. So uh, the bad news is um, our, both our, uh, our OPSERP and our Tier 1, Tier 2 rates are escalating in the next biennium. We get an advisory rate, which is nice because they give you a little preview of what you're expecting so we can be planful with that. But our uh, rates are going up by about 6% uh, on the average. And to us, that means a $35 million increase in our PERS costs in the next biennium. So $17 million each year. You think about escalation of uh, the, the roll-up costs to begin with that were over 11, now uh, add on the 17 uh, million each year. That just adds to that escalation of costs. And so again, really important that we're strategic and think ahead. I don't think we can be planful enough, but anything we can do uh, to mitigate now for next year and the following year will be helpful. So uh, we are uh, suggesting a number of proposed reductions because there are some places 
uh, in the system that we think we can do it in some vacancies and other places. So here's uh, where we are looking at. We have a, a 4.0 reduction of elementary licensed teachers because we went in and looked at how do we redistribute for uh, realigning class sizes across schools. So there's a 4.0 reduction there. Uh, we have a, a change in how our English language learners are identified and that has caused us to have fewer numbers of uh, students learning English as um, identified by the state process for identification. And so in doing that, we've not changed the ratio of how we're applying bilingual instructional assistance to schools, but we have been able to reduce because our numbers have reduced. So that's a reduction because of a number of student reduction. It does end up being 12.94 uh, positions or FTE of bilingual instructional assistance at the elementary level. We also had a half of a pro elementary program assistant that was vacant uh, last year that we won't pull back to full time. We've reduced 50,000 in professional development, 157,000 in our response to intervention system. I don't believe schools will see big impact from that. Uh, 25,000 in secondary STEM materials, five FTE of licensed in our English language development. This was a supplemental budget ad in uh, August, September, and we were not able to fill those positions without um, taking highly qualified teachers out of classrooms, so they, those uh, remain vacant. And uh, so we've pulled those out of this roll-up budget. Um, and we also have brought down our reserve uh, FTE um, by three. Uh, in the supplemental budget, there was also 353,000 for drug and alcohol counselors. And we um, were attempting to secure some contracted service for, services for that this year and had not been able to secure that. So we um, put that up as another um, place to reduce as we are planning for that next biennium. Uh, the total reductions, uh, which lots of them uh, were uh, also kind of technical adjustments, is in uh, the $2.4 million range. So just as some budget notes, um, back to that automated budget system, it is providing greater accuracy uh, and really important it, when we get your budget books and we'll walk you through to this page, that complete FTE description that's found on page 102, there were still lots of adjustments that happened. And so if it says realignment, what it really means is it's now coded in a different place. A great example of that is our translators were previously budgeted in, budgeted in 2110 attendance and social services and we've put them into the correct category of um, 2680 interpretation and translation services. So you'll be, see a big shift in FTE out of attendance and social services into interpretation and translation services. It isn't a program change, it's simply an accounting change. Uh, and then the second thing we started this last year, uh, we have uh, had had a long history of hiring limited term classified employees as we had students with um, special needs enter our district. And what happens in a limited term classified position is we hire them, their contract is over at the end of the year, we go back through a hiring process and we rehire them. So we had this churn in the system of people that wasn't really, um, didn't make sense for kids and didn't really cost us more money. So last year, we moved about, I think it was about 75 of those FTE from limited term into classified permanent. And we, so you saw a big escalation of FTE in that place in the budget book. This year, we're moving to phase two of that, which is to take another 71.25 limited term and put them into classified. It's not a cost. It's simply a way to have employees have stability of employment. They still get benefits as they would before, plus the hiring process churn that happens when you're ending a contract and rehiring over the summer. You'll find this FTE increase in 1220 restricted programs for students with disabilities. 
Uh, the May 15th election, that's on all of our minds. We have only provided a placeholder in this budget book for this, so you will not see any accounting for revenue or expenditures in the proposed budget. If, when the bond passes on May 15th, we will come back in on May 21st with ads to the proposed budget to support uh, the passage of the election. So if it passes, we'll come back to you on May 21st with more information around that. So finally, um, some quick notes on our grant funds. The Measure 98 fund last year, uh, we talked about really a new fund for us. We're unsure of what sort of revenue we would get. Uh, it is now called the High School Graduation and College and Career Readiness. Uh, it was formerly Measure 98. We're projecting about $6.1 million, and it's funded in Grant 240. So you'll find it in 240 in the budget book. One of the things is we've added the new um, commitment to Career Technical Education Center. So the law enforcement and business leadership development program are in that fund, just as the last two years have been. So we have three years of uh, CTEC in that fund. But I'll also come to you with a full report on May 8th regarding what's in that fund, because it's a fund that people have interest in and they want to know how we're expending it. So it's less about the numbers and more about here's what we're doing with these dollars. So we'll come to uh, on May 8th with that for you. Um, and then finally, we are seeing lots of volatility in our federal dollars, our federal dollars that come from the federal government, especially in the area of Title I-A, which is improving our basic programs. Uh, this is our title funding that comes to improve reading and math in our elementary, middle, and high schools. Um, and we're also seeing a reduction in Title I-D, ne neglected and delinquent youth. And what we're projecting right now is that that's going to be about a $1.4 million uh, reduction, and it will impact our schools. Our schools have already seen in their projected Title I distribution for next year some reduction of dollars, and so they're really having to think strategically about where exactly do they place those dollars. A note on Title I-A, uh, we get a large amount of dollars. I believe it's in the $14 million range. But because we have two high schools that are over 75% the poverty rate, those high schools take up a very large piece of the dollars. And you have to fund high schools over 75% and any school over 75% uh, with the Title I dollars. So it's difficult. In some districts, you can take those dollars and say, I'm going to invest them all in elementary and I'm gonna boost the elementary achievement. Well, in a school like Salem-Kaiser, where we have lots of schools that are above 60% poverty, the distribution of that um, is out further. We don't really get proportionally that many dollars. Um, so it's a, a tricky balance with that every year and one that we're continuing to um, watch. Uh, the federal uh, title allocations have been fairly volatile. Uh, one day you think they're there, the next day you don't. Um, we, at one point, thought our Title II dollars, which are for professional development, we thought that was totally axed out of the federal budget. So we had one budget prepared with nothing for those uh, Title II dollars, but then it came through. So that's why it's not on the slide, but it's just indicative of the volatility we're seeing um, out of the U.S. Department of Education and the budget. So as next steps, we have modified the agenda just slightly from what was previous. And our next meeting is on May 8th at 7 p.m. And at that meeting, we're going to take public comment. And for veteran board, board and budget committee members, what you know is um, that we usually waited till that last week in May. So you have public comment, public comment, approve the budget. This gives you public comment earlier in the process to see what the will of the public might be. And I think that's a great change uh, on this. So I think it was Rachel and Paul who helped us think that through. So I think that will be helpful. Um, and then we'll plan the rest of the time accordingly. Our goal is that you have approved the budget by uh, the end of May and that's passed on to the board for adoption um, in mid to end of June. So with that, I'll just remind you that our vision is all students graduate prepared for a successful life. Um, every year I say this, I think this budget 
does the um, best allocation of resources with the dollars we have. I don't think I could ever say that there are enough dollars to invest for all the things that we would want to invest in. And I could point to places along the way. So my goal was to assess the need, figure out where, where our highest priorities, and then also where our highest leverage was uh, for some student achievement results that we could really uh, target within this budget. And so I think this budget does that with the resources at hand. Um, I know you will have uh, lots of questions in the coming weeks. We will do our best to answer those timely and help you. We have enough new members that um, we're happy to spend any amount of time with you and understanding a very big document, a very large budget, and as quick as we can help you with that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the next section of the agenda, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next um, step in our process is we are actually going to take a short recess, about five minutes, and distribute the uh, proposed budgets and the related materials. And when we come back, um, what we're going to do is go over the protocols for asking questions of staff and also uh, protocols for deliberations and making recommended changes. So I want to make sure that we all hear and um, hear that, that piece of the, so I know you're going to get excited about your budget document, but we want to make sure we, <laughs> so we'll uh, recess for five minutes. Thank you. So thank you. So next on the agenda, we are going to go over the budget committee protocols uh, for questions and deliberations. And I do want to just pretty much walk through this so that we all understand uh, what the protocols are. And these, my understanding is these were developed um, last year and uh, were very effective in keeping the budget process moving. So, um, so starting with questions and requests for information. Uh, raised prior to May 8th. So what we're going to ask is questions that you have regarding the budget itself that you submit those in writing via email to Alice. Um, the questions will go to Alice and please also copy uh, Mike Wolf on those. And then uh, that will give staff about a week, I'm sorry, submit those by May 3rd. So that would be next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. And then when we return on May 8th, um, we will have Thursday. Thursday. When we return on May 8th. Third is on Thursday. Okay. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> to clarify, <laughs> please submit your questions in writing to Alice by May 3rd, close of business, next Thursday. And then the following uh, budget committee meeting on May 8th, um, we will have responses to those, um, and my understanding is those will be grouped. And um, so, if you know there are a lot of questions related to similar similar issues, that we'll get a you know a kind of collective response to those. Um, moving on to questions and requests for information raised at budget committee meetings, um, you know we point out that most questions can be answered during those deliberations, during those meetings by, uh, by staff. But if there are questions that do require um, additional review or study um, that will take significant staff time, what we are going to do is that um, by a committee vote, um, if there is uh, enough interest by the budget committee, um, we will propose those questions to staff for, that require additional research. Um, and the process will be that the chair will make the assignment to staff if there are at least six members interested in receiving a response. Um, and I believe, again, the idea is to not overburden staff with additional questions and additional research. We do want to make sure our questions are answered. However, um, you know, if there are one-offs, um, you know, that we can get answered in a budget committee meeting, we'll go ahead and do that. But if it requires additional uh, significant research, we want to make sure that there's enough interest by the committee. Okay, then um, the next area is changing the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, after the budget committee has heard all of the initial public testimony 
and um, has moved into deliberations. There may be desire by uh, a member to recommend changes to the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, and then we've outlined what the procedures for those proposed changes will be. So starting with, um, so a member of the committee will have the opportunity to identify changes they would like to be considered. Um, if a change is identified that would increase the budget, the committee member should also be prepared to identify an area of reduction to offset that increase. Each proposed change will be recorded on an initial list. And then second, beginning with the first proposed change, the committee member who recommended the change will give a brief one or two minute explanation of why they believe the change should be made and the impact to the proposed budget. After the explanation, other members will be asked by a show of hands if they would like, uh, like that proposed change to remain on the list for further consideration. Six members or five um, in addition to the person making the recommendation must concur in order for the proposed change to remain on the list for further consideration. And then the chair will use uh, Robert's rule of order in considering each of the remaining proposed changes on the list. The number of votes required to pass um, of a motion would be eight committee members. And then if the committee makes changes to the superintendent's proposed budget, additional staff work may be required to modify uh, the document and an opportunity for additional public testimony may also be necessary. Where we're at? Okay. Oh. All right. okay. Paul, question? I have a question under number three. Is that eight or is it a, a majority of the quorum? It's, you it, want me to answer that? Go ahead. It, it's, and, and it's, I, it's I'm eight. asking the chair, Mike. <laughs> well, and if I get it wrong, I would like Mike to correct me. That's so um, so we're following Robert's rules, but based on the size of the committee, um, it would be eight is what we've... Sure we're why? Right here. Unless everybody's not here. If there's, if there's only nine people here, you mean you need eight. If you only have eight people here, all eight have to agree. That's what you're saying? Yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. and, and my understanding is that is... A just a majority. That is correct. It's because of the size of the budget committee. So okay. not a majority of those present, so, but eight members of the budget committee. So if I want to break quorum, I only need to take six friends with me. And then you couldn't vote on anything because I would, you wouldn't have eight votes in here. Is that correct? I'm gonna look at Mike for that answer. Y yes, uh, this, goes, this goes back to the board governance discussion around the role of the budget committee and the number of um, votes it takes to change the budget. And that's what we're talking about, is changing the budget would require eight votes. And if you don't have the eight members for the eight votes, then you can't take the vote. Okay. Okay. So to clarify, so not the quorum of those present, but a total of eight budget committee members must vote in favor of a proposed change. Yes, and um, uh, Rachel may remember a few years back we ran into this very issue which uh, actually precipitated the, the governance uh, uh, clarification by the board so that it takes eight to change the budget. Right, and, and I will clarify this was discussed with, um, you know, with myself and, and Levy about, uh, you know, we looked at last year's uh, protocols and, and agreed that this would be, um, you know, the protocol moving forward as well. I just, I mean, is that, that's a board rule? I mean, I know that the, the majority of the body as a whole for a board vote is statute, but is the budget committee a statute or a board rule for the budget committee? The, the, uh, board governance dealing with the budget committee role and the fact that it takes eight to change the budget is in alignment with the statute. Mm -hmm. okay. Sharon, yes, I'm sorry. Site attendance, okay. People Meaning, if you're, if you're if you're calling can't physically in, physically be here, but call in is that adequate? Right, and we've had uh, we've had some folks call in on prior meetings, so right. But yeah. as far as but you can still vote issues. Yes, okay. you can still vote. Thank you for the clarification. And we'll make sure that um, your vote is heard over the phone, so. Okay. You have to be able to hear the presentation and any discussion. Sure. So you have to be part of the deliberations and then technically you can vote. Thank you. 
Any other questions, comments about the protocols? Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's see. So next up is the overview by Mike Wolf on the 2018-2019 uh, proposed budget. Okay, this is the group activity uh, part of the meeting, so we'll, um, we'll turn some pages and um, go through the format. So the 18-19 proposed uh, budget document represents a continuation of the improvement efforts that began last year with a tighter budget development process using our financial management system. And uh, before we get uh, into the document itself, I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank Sarah Head and her team. Uh, and so in the crowd, we have uh, the team. And um, also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, John Bate and the HR team for all their efforts in pulling this together. It was truly a collaborative process. And this year, you'll notice that the budget document has a new look and feel, and that's due to the involvement of uh, Lillian Govis and her team in communications. So we're, we're very proud to present this to you tonight uh, as the superintendent's proposed budget. So let's uh, start at the beginning with the table of contents. So if you look at uh, uh, the table of contents, uh, which would be page one, and one of the things that I'd like to, um, to guide you through just briefly here is uh, look at the fund summaries that are about two-thirds down the page, and you'll notice that each fund has the actual fund numbers off to the right. So like, for instance, after the general fund, which is Fund 101, which is the 100 tab, the general fund, so you're able to go right to the tab to get into whichever funds you're interested in. The rest of the funds on this page are basically the 200 series, which is if you look at the, your 200 tab, that's the special revenue funds. So the way that the table of contents is laid out, you see the page number, you can go right to the page number, or you can just, you'll know exactly which tab uh, to pull to get to the fund that you're interested in, okay? All right, so next, starting on page five, let's get into the uh, introduction which includes the superintendent's budget message in letter form. The profile of the district, you can just flip through these pages. I'll, I'll guide you uh, to uh, page 19 here in the end. Uh, profile of district, uh, student enrollment and class size information. You'll find budget policies, procedures, regulations, and uh, a budget development calendar. And then um, if you can fast forward to page 19, and if I'm going too fast, let me know. Uh, if you can fast forward to page 19, uh, what we do here is we list out the major budget assumptions that were used to build the budget. And so these are always uh, important for you to understand as a budget committee what, uh, what numbers, what assumptions we were using to pull the document together. Okay. Um, if you flip over to page 22, it shows the, the revenue breakdown for the total budget. As Christy presented, this is a fairly large budget at uh, almost uh, $691.5 uh, million. Uh, and so uh, that brings us to the fund summaries uh, tab on page uh, 27. So if we can just, you see the fund summaries tab, let's flip that over. And we're on page 27, you'll see that the funds are broken down by resources and requirements uh, to describe where the resources are coming from and how they're budgeted to be spent. So a, a function code describes the activity that is carried out like instruction. And the object code further breaks down the expenditure in what is being paid for, like salaries within instruction. And each fund is broken down in a similar manner. So it doesn't matter what fund you're looking at, you've got the same exact structure uh, that you can guide yourself through. So let's turn to the general fund on page 47. You can see that the total general fund is um, uh, over uh, $485 million and as uh, was included in the superintendent's budget message represents about 70% of the, of the total budget. The first few pages in the general fund uh, describe resources, or where the general fund resources come from, starting with the taxes and revenue that you can see on page 48, uh, intermediate sources, which are really mainly from the Willamette ESD pass-through funds that we receive, and then you can see um, state, federal, and other sources. 
And then um, page 51 begins the description of how the resources are planned to be spent within the 1000 series, and that's, that's related to instruction. So if you take a look at 51, I'll guide you through the next few pages just to get a feel how the structure's set up, and then it's very similar throughout the rest of the document. So um, when you look at page 51, you see the, uh, the 1000 function, which is instruction, and then part of that is the 1100 uh, breakdown, which is regular programs, and then we move into the 1111, which is elementary instruction. And then if you flip the page over, uh, you can see the 1121 is middle school instruction. And then you flip the page over again, and you see on page 54, 1131 is high school instruction. So that gives you a sense of uh, kind of how uh, we move through the documents. You can, um, so now that we've gone through the 1000 series, then there's the 2000 series, which is support services, and that begins on page 67. So if we could move to 67 to give you a sense of how that's broken out, you can see that it's the 2000 series, which is the support services, and then you get into each of the different units within the 2000 series. And so you can see that we start with the 2110, which is attendance and social work services, and we work our, our way through um, the document, the general fund uh, that ends on page 96. So I didn't necessarily think you wanted to go through every page turn on this, but just to give you a flavor for how the document's set up and the expenditures uh, that are included in the document. So if we're okay, then um, if you could move to page 96, and that's uh, where the general fund the breakdown as far as function and object code ends. And we can talk about some of the summary sheets uh, and the roll-up sheets. So on page 97, well, so on 96, what you see is it's the total roll-up of the general fund. So there's our bottom line. There's our general fund. I'm thinking we've got a question. You want to save the question to the end? That's my first question. It, is it related to well, this page? No, it was related to earlier pages. Okay, then how about if we... That's fine. You want to jump in or you want to keep going? Let's keep going. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, th so now we're on page uh, 96, and you can see um, that this is really the roll-up of the general fund. And you saw we started with the chart with, and how it was broken down. We went in by each function and then each object code describing how the expenditures are planned to be um, uh, spent. Um, and as Superintendent Perry said, when you look at the total contingency, again, there's the 4.5% contingency that's built into the general fund. And so now we're at the summary section, which begins on page 97 with roll-ups by function. So again, this is just another way to look at all of the pages that we quickly flip through. So if you want to know how much is being spent on instruction, total instruction, which would be every one of the thousand series from the 11, 1110 all the way through the 1400, which is summer programs, you can see the total proposed amount is slightly over $296 million, and the total FTE is uh, pushing over 2,975. So that's how uh, the summary sheet rolls up the entire general fund. Um, and then uh, you can also see that it's rolled up by um, salaries and APC. So if you flip over the page now on page 98, what you can see is how all of those uh, salaries and wages are broken down in the general fund. So these are total roll-ups for the general fund. So in other words, salary and wages, salaries and wages for the general fund add up to um, $254.7 million. Associated payroll costs in the general fund is $161.7 million. And so these are the roll-up pages that sort of tell you everything that was included in the previous uh, pages for the general fund. And you'll see that for every fund uh, throughout the document. Okay. All right, so that brings us to a series of FTE summaries uh, that begin on page 101. 
So in the, the FTE uh, summaries, you can see, for instance, we've got the total licensed staff roll-up, and you can see what's in the current budget, the 2017-18 budget, with 2,407 positions. You can see that we end up with 2,408 positions, and this uh, is really just part of the status quo or flat uh, that uh, Superintendent Perry talked about as far as this budget. You can also see in classified that there is a significant FTE increase, and part of that is, again, reflective of uh, some of the changes that were included in the superintendent's budget message, uh, but the majority of that is the um, limited term staff that were in the uh, student services budget that are now moving into permanent. And so to break that down even further, though, pages uh, 102 and 110 explain that in more detail. So now we're shifting to a different roll-up and a different comparison look. And so when we look at um, the, the major increase in classified FTE on page 102, about uh, two-thirds of the way down the page in the 1220 function, you can see right there that uh, we've converted 71.25 uh, FTE from um, limited term to permanent. So that's just another way to break down some of the changes that are embedded throughout the document in, in the roll-up sheets. If you look at uh, page uh, 103, just uh, down a little bit, you can see in 1291, this is where the interpretive services that the superintendent talked about, the 12.94 positions, are being removed from this function and they'll be added uh, to the proper function, um, which is on page 106, which is interpretive and translation services. So really what you see is a technical adjustment that's laid out in um, the comparison in the roll-up sheets. All right. And then, essentially, um, we'll wrap up the general fund with uh, the explanation of FTE changes on page 107. Again, this is another way to capture all of the net changes in the entire general fund. So you'll see there's a lot of realignment here. And as Superintendent said, that's not adding to the budget. That's just making sure that we're, we've got the expenditures in the right uh, functions and the right object codes. So the remaining funds are organized in a similar fashion to the general fund, uh, and in the interest of time tonight, uh, I hadn't planned on going through each of those funds, uh, but I think you've got the Rosetta Stone on how to do that, and um, if you have any questions, uh, clearly, well, we can ask them tonight, and um, if afterwards, because you just received this document, you have questions, we're happy to take them via email. So, Paul. Kylo, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, I think I found the answer and I don't like it. But Mike, if I look on page 52, mm -hmm. I have a, uh, if I look at middle school instruction and I see salaries and wages, associated payroll costs, purchase services, supplies, various capital outlay, then middle school extracurricular, how would I find out, for example, how much a program that we know is at the middle schools costs us? Because I don't see it broken out here. Yeah, yeah. You, that that would be a really good question for well, us to dig into. That is a question I'm asking you to dig. I will be asking you to dig into. Sure. But is it, it's not here anywhere, so I can't look it up. No, these are. It would be under either a purchase service or I mean, it would have to fall under mm -hmm. some object code. Okay. Or it would be part of the instruction um, uh, costs as well. But these are just these are macro level roll ups. Okay. So, um, but behind that is all of the information we have in our uh, financial management system to drill down and get that detail. Okay. Thank you. Other questions at this point? Okay. Mark? Um, this is sort of a process <coughs> question. Um, this is the first year budget message where the entire preparation of the budget message took place after the board adopted the equity lens. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in the process. How did the equity lens impact your process of assembling this budget, assembling the budget message? Are there significant findings that you had? Who was involved? All of those kinds of things. So how about we bring that to May 8th? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question. Thank you. Virginia, did you have a question? Other questions, sorry, other questions on process or at this point? Okay, so uh, I guess then last on the agenda is going over the meeting schedule. Actually, before I do that, um, I do have clarification for the question that came up regarding where did the decision relating to eight budget committee members um, derive from? And it is in, it's in board policy. Mm -hmm. It's in, it is in policy BG12, the budget committee job description and it's in 1F, uh, utilize the ma majority vote requirement, which requires affirmation votes by a majority of the committee, eight out of 14, be required for any motion before the committee. So it's actually in board policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so moving on to the meeting schedule. Um, as the superintendent mentioned, the May 8th will be our next uh, committee meeting. It starts at 7 versus 6. Um, and this will be the first opportunity for public comment. And we do want to point out that there will be two other opportunities for public comment as well in later meetings. Uh, but this will be the first one. We'll also have a Measure 98 uh, distribution update. And then also budget proposal discussions um, and responses to the questions that we provide to staff by May 3rd. And then Tuesday, May 15th at 5.30, budget committee meeting, uh, continuation of the budget proposal discussion. And if we need additional time for public comment, that's when we'll take that public comment. And then rolling into week of May 21st, um, those will be Monday, Tuesday, um, and those will be the actual deliberations of the budget committee on those two days. Also, uh, my understanding is we will also take public comment on those days. Um, and then Wednesday and Thursday, as needed, uh, continue those deliberations um, the remainder of that week. I think that's it. All right. Are there any questions about the schedule or anything else? I can't see you. <laughs> okay. I guess that is it then. So we are adjourned for this evening. Thank you. I need the school board members to remain. In fact, I'm calling, a, calling us to order. Uh, the school board will now be going into executive session in room three.